All right, that'll work. Okay. I don't need my notes. Okay, so here's the ASU charter. Uh, the good thing about this is we, uh, you know, we are, are definitely based on our design uh, aspirations. We are embedded in the community, and as I go forward with the presentation, you'll you'll see where that matters, right? So we're the largest university in the, the U.S. by population and by square footage currently. Uh, we have 500 plus classrooms. Um, there's 13,000 bicycles on campus every day, and if you've ever visited the campus, you'll realize that. And of course, we have a, a nice collection of rattlesnakes. Uh, some important factors are that we're ranked number four in the world for U.S. patents, uh, universities that don't have a medical school. We're also ranked number six in uh, uh, federal funded grants uh, for universities uh, that don't have a medical school, because we partner with a, a, a fair amount of uh, clinical practices uh, in the Valley. And of course, now we're second year voted most innovative university, uh, two years in a row by a head of MIT and Stanford. So that's always a neat one. Why is that? Well, uh, Dr. Crow's been in his current appointment, I believe 10 years, and he's a start with why guy. And he hires the appropriate people and gets onto their way. So everybody's probably familiar with this model, right? The Simon Sinek start with why model. And this is the kind of vision that he's put out uh, throughout the university. It allows for things like uh, collaborative competition, if you will, amongst different groups for uh, 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 funding opportunities and, and uh, research of public value. So currently, we are above our target. Uh, our Total spendings and research expenditures are targeted for 700 million by 2020, and I'm quite sure at this point uh, that we're gonna go beyond that. And of course, once again, we're focused on the community, and, and we believe that uh, higher education needs to be available to, to all Arizonans. And, uh, we extend that to, uh, uh, you know, everybody on the planet, if it was possible, but we'll, we'll start with our state first. We have a small staff, and, and as you'll see in the presentation, that's another key factor, uh, and it's a, it's a factor that makes our, our desire to go out in the uh, uh, world of, of vendors and find public-to-private partnerships that bring value uh, that's mutual, not just those partnerships where uh, you know, we cut them a PO and they wheel in some sort of thing and we pay for support. It, it, it truly has to be mutually benefit, beneficial to work for us. So we built a model, we talked about it last year, this uh, TransCore uh, framework knowledge engine. Uh, and as you'll see from kind of as this builds out, when we first put this together, I think the, the thing that should jump out here is it's made up of disparate uh, components. So we had uh, a large chunk of HPC, just like every other university does. Uh, we had some, some good sized data pools and reservoirs, plus we have the standard components like the 1,000 genomes, the, uh, the Cancer Genome Atlas. We have right now about four, 4.5 petabytes of uh, data specific to these projects. And one of our biggest and most significant challenges is how do we mine uh, valuable insight from this data when it exists in, in all these pools, right? I think uh, at the time of my appointment, we had seven touch points on storage, right? We had compellent, we had, uh, we had luster. Uh, it made it very difficult to, to manage and deal with, never mind get to the next step and, and gain insight, right? So uh, we started a model called the, the 3C model, which stands for uh, condo, cloud, and co-location. Co-location, we incentivized uh, uh, other research centers to bring their equipment into our data center so then we could manage uh, components of it with OpenStack and while they were not using it, we could then harness those uh, uh, CPU hours and give them out to researchers who were uh, unfunded, essentially extending ubiquitous compute. So uh, everybody's familiar with the SETI at home, or am I dating myself when I say that, right? The space exploration. Uh, and, and then there's uh, uh, Stanford's folding at home. These both work on that same principle that uh, if you can harvest a, uh, additional CPU cycles, you can let somebody else use them uh, when you're not using them. And then, of course, we wanted to build out into the cloud. Well, you know, 
Ask 10 people what the cloud is, you receive uh, 11 answers. And our position really had to be one that was, was vendor agnostic. And so as we started to look at the workloads, we figured, okay, how can we take this heat map, which is essentially uh, an output map from Slurm, anybody who's done HPC probably recognizes it, and move those workloads to places where they make sense, uh, and thus free up the, the additional space on the core cluster. Has anybody ever heard the term uh, condo as it uh, pertains to HPC? Uh, look at it like a timeshare. You have a whole bunch of nodes in, in any infrastructure you want, Supermicro, Dell, whatever, uh, chassis-based nodes, and uh, they function like a timeshare, and that's how the, the condo model works. The deficiency is, is it's one size fits all. So it, that produces some, some significant challenges because it doesn't support things like GPU compute, doesn't, doesn't support uh, uh, Hadoop. So when we look at HPC and Hadoop, and if you, you follow the lineage back, uh, they're, they're very similar. They're both uh, parallelization systems. Uh, they have a lot of the same components. And kind of as this, as this builds out, what you'll see is as you move workloads over there, ones that appropriately fit, you can actually reduce complexity to some degree uh, by doing that because you remove a few of the other components that fit into HPC, whether it be, uh, whether it be uh, additional databases or Lustre or things like InfiniBand. Uh, so many of these workloads fit over uh, quite well. So now we have HPC, we have, uh, we have Hadoop, and, and the question is, w which one's gonna produce for us, right? So we, we knew we were getting some efficiency out of it. Uh, the problem is we really couldn't figure out which one was gonna be most productive as we get into this kind of digital data revolution that we have, right? So uh, there was a question a minute ago about uh, uh, precision medicine and uh, personalized medicine, and, and whatever we'll probably name it next week uh, means the same thing. It means getting uh, valuable insights from a large repository of data and then figuring out how to target a treatment that fits you most specifically. ASU is part of the National uh, Research and Education Network, which means that we have uh, 100 gig ethernet on internet to, to 24 partner institutions, right? So people in the room that, that uh, 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 have been at, uh, in research or in, in the enterprise space understand that if you have a, a large available chunk of bandwidth, uh, it really removes a lot of the boundaries that you have in these standard operations. For us, the game changes are the same as they are for you guys, right? Data science is, is important to us. We, uh, we've built curriculum around data science uh, with, uh, with the Mayo, uh, with our uh, uh, decision theater, uh, within our computer science department. Uh, we also uh, have embraced all these partnerships, uh, specifically with uh, Hortonworks, with Nimble Storage prior to the HPE uh, uh, acquisition, uh, with Brocade, who I think they've been acquired now too, uh, and, and several others. And, and we've essentially driven out the incumbents that we used to have. And of course, uh, the university, like many uh, our research institutions, is, is very much interested in Internet of Things, and as I go further, I'll show you we're actually doing some stuff with it. So this just talks about uh, what, our, what data science is. Uh, here's our Internet of Things and sensors, partnerships. And of course, as I said over Internet 2, um, we're able to now trade uh, information. So uh, does anybody know what the TCGA is? It's the Cancer Genome Atlas, right? We maintain, so everybody in the room has essentially this uh, uh, very similar genomic information, 99.5% alike, but then we also have uh, variations. And those variations that exist in that little piece uh, can amount to a, a huge amount of data if we start to have multiple samples. Because of this, it's possible for one institution to maintain uh, a large repository of, of epidemiology data and genomic data and us to not maintain the same one, because right now we all have this same big catalog of stuff, this multi-petabyte chunk of stuff, uh, and there's a lot of redundancy. So we can actually achieve kind of some WAN deduplication by you maintaining your set, 
and us maintaining ours, and then sending queries back and forth that are uh, essentially uh, SQL queries that are managed by uh, tag-based security so I can allow you to see what you want to see because uh, maybe, I, maybe my focus is prostate cancer, maybe yours is hepatocellular cancer. So you could ask a question uh, uh, within the command line to say, hey, do you have uh, heterozygous alleles at position 200 on gene 355? Yes or no, and the, uh, uh, the metadata and the tags that are sent for that piece of data will allow you to see that, and then all the information that's related to that, and that's only possible because we have the, the available bandwidth to do that. We'd love to establish Phoenix as a national healthcare leader, so in the beginning I was talking about our, our partnerships here and why we don't have a medical school. Well, it's because we have a, a great relationship uh, with these practices here, and we've defined a, a class of problems that we would like to, to work with them to resolve. Uh, we have a huge aging population. We'd like to figure out, uh, you know, how we treat the, the folks that uh, uh, would be classed as frequent flyers that come into the emergency room over and over. And uh, uh, we'd also like to work on problems that I think everybody understands. Uh, uh, the country has an opiate problem right now, right? People uh, taking painkillers, they're, they're ending up dead. Uh, anybody with a medical background and most nurses in the ER knows who these people are, right? It's in those records. Uh, they have the signs and symptoms. They're shopping doctors, and they're, they're easy to find. Uh, and, you know, the greater percentage of them aren't, you know, uh, contrary to popular opinion, aren't trying to kill themselves. And a lot of them aren't drug addicts. It's just a, uh, it's, it's a fairly volatile drug in the way it's dispensed and managed. So, so the Arizona Open Cloud is, is really the... the end product of what we're, we're still working to deliver that allows us to integrate uh, educators, researchers, and, uh, uh, and research faculty into a group that can use a, a singular web interface to access all the resources that we have available uh, and also expand to the, the public cloud space, right? So, uh, and I think if you guys have probably seen this one before. We, uh, we're moving workloads uh, with Ironic over to Penguin Computing because it's a bare metal compute. We also use a, a small percentage of Amazon, but we kind of discussed that, that there's some difficulty in, in doing the ex extrapolation of cost. But I truly believe that this is the way we're going to keep the big public cloud providers honest by being able to have uh, thoughtful APIs that connect to a, a multitude of them so we can define workloads holistically to figure out what plays where, right? So everybody knows Amazon uh, has a lot of different pricing models and templates, uh, and they also run on a, a largely uh, virtualized uh, uh, chunk of infrastructure, right? Uh, Azure is similar, but Azure also has some different features that play in that uh, are also kind of uh, pay on demand. And then, of course, Google has a, a fairly good genomic suite that we can access. So uh, by by not going all in with one provider, it allows us to really make sure we're getting the, the, the right pricing because at the end of the day, the money we spend on this, if you were resident of Arizona, it comes from you. So we have to be thoughtful of that, right? So as we look at this uh, data revolution that we're taking part of, we, we have some roadblocks, right? And we talked about it this morning. Uh, security and compliance is a, is a big problem. The, the considerable amount of uh, disparate uh, uh, resource pools between uh, Epic's EMR and, and, and multiple other uh, systems that are out there that maintain this differential data that nobody's incentivized to put together to truly bring precision medicine to where it needs to be. Uh, cybersecurity, right? Uh, there's not a day that goes by in the news now where we're not talking about some level of cybersecurity, right? And, uh, uh, you know, when I started to put this slide deck together, this gentleman on here, Mueller, who now is part of an investigative panel that's going on, uh, wasn't even in, in my thoughts. I just, I just thought that the quote was good, right, about saying there's, there's only two types of companies, ones that have been hacked and ones that, that will be hacked. And, and, and that is true. So we have to understand our risk matrix. We have to know that every time we turn around and, and implement something new, we not only do we expand functionality, but we, we, we open up the threat vector. And, and that really is kind of the risk of doing business because your other option, as it says down here, is to uh, uh, shut your machine off, unplug it, uh, throw it in a lead room, and, and, and maybe it'll be safe. And uh, uh, as funny as that seems, there's, there's just no functionality to that. I spent uh, six years at Medicare, Medicaid, 
and I had a gentleman down the hall, and I'm sure you've all heard your, the sneaker net stories. Uh, we used to copy patient data to uh, two terabyte drives, and I had a stack of them. I had a picture in another presentation. I do have about 80 of them behind me, and we would just carry them down the hall because it was easy to do that, and then we'd FedEx them to, to other branches, and we would take them in and then aggregate data that way. Uh, why? For security, right? For, for security, for uh, it, completely inefficient, but it was the only methodology we had at the time. So, what happens at the university? Well, uh, we have a ton of events. Most of these are brute force attacks. Most of them, uh, uh, of these incidents are uh, attempts to access uh, data, attempts to access a secure area. Uh, they go on a, on a, on a daily basis and, and, you know, we've had, uh, you know, somewhere around 10,000 escalations this year alone. And, and that's very common. And I think we have had this level of activity for some time, but until we started monitoring for it and kind of running this through, this also goes through our Hadoop system, by the way. It goes in through uh, Splunk uh, into a, a utility called Hunk, which is uh, the Hadoop for Splunk sort of MapReduce uh, uh, real-time analytics. Uh, so we process a ton of events now. I think in our previous system that we had, uh, we couldn't process the events fast enough, so we didn't know about them. Therefore, they didn't, we didn't see them, so they didn't happen. So now we, we're aware that they're, they're taking place. Um, we got a problem with code. Uh, and, and I know you guys are recording this, but uh, we have a problem with reproducibility. We have a problem with abandonware. Uh, you know, we, we write this stuff that's uh, not backward compatible. It's uh, not rep reproducible. And a lot of times it's shit, it, it, to say what it is. Uh, and that happens. I worked with uh, uh, groups of pharmacists while, uh, uh, a couple years ago while I was at College of Southern Nevada who had written most of their own applications. These are pharmacists. They don't have a programming background. And they wrote a couple uh, applications they were using for some compounding of medications. Uh, these are not the best applications. Uh, matter of fact, one of them, even to start it up, uh, uh, you know, as recent as about eight years ago, uh, you would have to connect a modem to it or use a modem uh, emulator, because it wouldn't work if it didn't have a modem for whatever reason, right? That's how, that's how poorly engineered this is. And uh, academia is route with this stuff, and it's a huge challenge because now we look at, well, it produces a, a security hole that's, that's, that's definitely exploitable. So who's familiar with uh, the patenting of, of uh, uh, genomes and, and human genes? Anybody heard about this? It's part of your body, and somebody else is going to go patent it, right? This is a wonderful thing, right? So uh, if they tell you, well, you should get tested here, and uh, uh, you know, you look at the two popular ones, BRCA1, BRCA2, uh, Myriad went out and, and uh, got a patent on these. Well, this is a, a huge problem. Uh, and, of course, if you were going to go out and get tested the, the way they've controlled the market, and, and, of course, you'd get tested at least twice, it would cost you about eight grand. And maybe you don't have that. Not only that, but potentially that type of genomic therapy might not even be covered on your insurance, right? So this might be an out-of-pocket expense. And, uh, you know, th this company has leveraged technology that uh, an insight that we've mined in the, the NIH and NSF and, and academia, and, and the government spent quite a bit of uh, tax dollars to go out and, and do this. Uh, uh, thankfully, the Supreme Court decided that uh, uh, this information uh, couldn't be patented. However, there's still a, a good percentage of it out there for variants that are patented. Uh, currently today around, uh, around uh, uh, 20 percent, and the, the uh, ACLU is still trying to, to work out this problem. So uh, there's a bioethics problem, too. Uh, believe me when I tell you, that's also a security problem. It's, it's, it's a very real security problem. And as we talked about uh, uh, boundaries to precision medicine, that's a, that's a significant one. So if we go back to security, We've looked at our perimeter and we've, we've, we've said, okay, look, uh, there are a lot of choices out there and, and it seems like you can easily get crippled by the choices. So uh, currently to meet um, uh, our, uh, the current NIST guideline, which is the newest one for uh, uh, controlled unclassified information is uh, 800 -171. It governs non-federal systems, but it's restrictive enough that it would cover uh, FERPA, which uh, basically covers student information, uh, and uh, HIPAA information, right? So you pick the most restrictive policy, uh, and many of the, the tuning parameters that we have in this slide here, 
uh, pertain to security models like we were talking about this morning uh, that are FISMA and, and greater. And, and FISMA is a, a pretty tough uh, a level to get to. We're talking that's uh, Department of Defense, uh, NSA uh, uh, type stuff, and it, and it takes some maintenance to get there. So we had uh, built a large repository around, uh, around Swift, and we were migrating over to S3. We are using a product called uh, uh, Swift Stack. Uh, we've now, since uh, uh, we've adopted uh, uh, Ranger on, on a handful of uh, cluster nodes we have, been able to get the same sort of metadata management and tag-based security that we're getting uh, from Swift, but also get uh, things like the data durability, uh, geolocality, some of the other features built in, uh, which, has been, which has been pretty handy for us. Uh, and as you guys know, Knox just supplies a, a, another perimeter gateway, and of course we're, we're, uh, we've got uh, uh, Kerberos implemented as well. And uh, as we've built these data repository classifications, the, we can't just lock ourselves down to, to be FISMA uh, high or FISMA moderate, because then we're not going to be able to work with all the partners we, we need to work with, right? So we're, um, there's an initiative now called In Common that, that goes with Internet2 that's uh, an, yet another uh, standard for, for SSO. It seems like every year I go to the Internet2 and the academic conference and somebody has yet an, a new standard for, uh, for a single sign-on. But, uh, uh, you know, we, we've, we've been happy with this so far as long as it, they don't move the goal line once again. Uh, so here's what the newest model looks like right here. We have our customer portal. Uh, we have our, our web interface where you go on, you pick your applications, you, uh, uh, you choose where you want to run your workload. It goes out and provisions uh, 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 components using the open source tool set that we have. And uh, uh, we send the workloads that we have templates built for uh, directly up to the, our cloud partners. And uh, the impact of this since its adoption has been significant enough that we had a year ago, two years ago, we had 200,000 core hours a year is what we were burning. Uh, right now we, we do about 2.2 million core hours a month. So not to say that uh, uh, that uh, this is, is causation, right? This correlation will, will equal causation, but uh, because we've used so much more, our, our proposals are exponentially higher and so are our awards, right? So uh, the ability to extend ubiquitous compute through this hybrid cloud model uh, has, been, has been pivotal to us in our ability to go out there and, and get more funding opportunities because we, we create more proposals, right? So uh, the Hadoop ecosystem has been pretty easy to get to, to uh, go up to the cloud for us, right, uh, uh, by building models with the, uh, with the cloud providers, although somebody told me today, or I heard today in one of the talks something about uh, was a cloud break or something, is that what it's called? Anybody use this thing? Cloud break? No? Yeah, is it any good? Because maybe that's, maybe that's the, the next thing we'll do, because right now we're still kind of doing this uh, 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 templated ironic build uh, system to do our, our Hadoop node. So uh, talk to me afterwards, we'd, we'd definitely be interested in that. Uh, Multi-tenancy, uh, huge for us, because right now we, I think we have 64 physical uh, uh, nodes that we run Hortonworks on, uh, and that cluster itself is uh, raw around three petabyte. Uh, but we had, a, we had a tough time the first three years in this implementation around sharing workloads and being able to divide it up. Now we, we actually have a multi-tenant environment, which is uh, uh, beneficial as well. So EQTL. Uh, last year I talked about this a little bit. It's a, it's a way we uh, 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 process trait loci for uh, uh, DNA. Um, we used to run it in MapReduce, and you can see the, the lower numbers are better. Uh, even in HPC, in bare metal HPC, only, only in most of the cases uh, uh, is a little bit uh, uh, less productive than, than MapReduce. And then, of course, in Spark, obviously, we get, uh, uh, we get a much better result, right? So what's behind that? Well, it's, it's uh, you know, again, 10 to the seventh uh, loci. Uh, uh, times 10 to the fourth phenotypes, and then your, your tissue types and p-values, right? So this is a lot of small computations, and uh, a Spark does a, a great job with this. Uh, last year, I also talked about our, uh, the Tumio simulator that uh, Carlo Mele and Melissa Wilson-Sayers have been working on. This is the output that uh, uh, 
uh, we now produce, and, and what's important about this and significant is uh, you and I could have the, the same type of cancer, uh, but how do we figure out who should get prioritization in that treatment? Well, probably the one who's progressing the fastest, right? So this simulation allows us to determine which tumors grow at which rate to, to determine which person should uh, uh, be prioritized in the, in the treatment. Uh, protein evolution, we're uh, looking at, um, uh, you know, how uh, 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 things like MRSA evolve at the, at the protein level, right? How, uh, how do they become uh, 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 methicillin resistant, right? And it, and it, it has to do with protein and, it's, and it requires uh, uh, a large amount of simulations to get there. Actually, there's a, uh, a piece uh, in my recent book that talks about this. It's done by a student, uh, Abhishek Kumar. Uh, who's, I believe, doing his, his, his uh, 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 postdoctoral work in, it, uh, in Chicago right now, but uh, uh, it's, it's fantastic stuff. It was part of his dissertation. So what are we doing with this stuff? Every time somebody talks about Internet of Things, uh, it seems to be one of those deals where we collect a bunch of sensor data. We spent two years collecting sensor data that we realized that most of it was, was garbage. We couldn't do anything with it. So what are we doing now? Uh, we're putting little beacon points around. So when a, a student comes on campus, not only can they uh, use the phone app to uh, do kind of a, uh, uh, you know, call the police or call for a medical emergency or report something or go right on there and tweet and tell us the wireless sucks or, or you know, they can't find their class or whatever else. And uh, we can geolocate them based on, uh, uh, based on this sensor network that we're building up. Same here with the, the special events and, and uh, uh, having these integrated into the app. It allows us, so when you have 90, 95,000 students and you have a campus that uh, has 500 classrooms that takes up pretty much the whole town of Tempe, uh, really tough to manage and awful when somebody comes in and you give them a, a map. Uh, it's not very helpful, right? So uh, the one thing I'd, I'd love to see built into this is uh, if we could start to do some intelligent rerouting. So when it's 115 degrees, if it could show you a path that you could go through just cutting through buildings, right? So you'd never have to expose yourself to the sun. That would be, a, I think that would be a, a handy uh, uh, addition to this. And then, of course, we have uh, CHEER, which is our Center for Health uh, Information and Research. Uh, which essentially holds the decisive project where, uh, where uh, we spoke about before, where these healthcare providers are now going to provide us with uh, specific chunks of uh, either uh, de-identified clinical data uh, and clinical trials information that we're going to use to then uh, define some interesting inroads into precision medicine. This look familiar? Looks like an eye chart, doesn't it? So uh, in working with Hortonworks over the, the past year, we were trying to define a, a uh, next generation genomics pipeline that was going to remain open source. I know uh, some folks in, in Yale are still working on this. Uh, uh, anybody heard of, of AMP Lab? Anybody heard of that? Uh, it used to run in uh, 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 Cloudera. Um, I, I think it's somewhat been abandoned now since funding's run out because Cloudera was going to productize it. I actually stood up in a uh, one of their sessions at one point at their data summit and asked, hey, are you guys going to make this a, a paid utility? They said no, but, you know, we still have, we, we haven't seen any valuable output and, and nobody's ever fixed the, the variant caller piece of that. So uh, I, I believe the guys at, at uh, Yale, Dr. Wade Schultz, is going to continue to move on with this and then hopefully we'll, we'll partner back up with it. But uh, it is an interesting conglomeration of, of pieces. But uh, uh, we're hoping with our new cloud model, we'll be able to uh, participate in this by having uh, uh, WAN shared uh, uh, nodes that can participate in these workloads, right? So uh, that's our goal, data in, knowledge out. And uh, as we do these things, I, I love this quote. It's uh, as you explain this to people in, in the challenges in precision, precision medicine, it really is that simple. The hard thing about hard things is they're hard, right? So that's my spiel. That's my book. Anybody got any questions? Yes, sir. What kind of security do you have your rest of? Uh, that is a good question. Um, right now, we're we're still using um, uh, we're still using Sweet B encryption on our our tunnels between uh, across our backbone network on Internet Two. So the services themselves uh, were we're not securing because we're not extending those out beyond 
the providers that we have that are targeted partners, right? So we have a internet to Amazon pipeline that they've already built that's kind of a, 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 a certificate-based mobile network that we, that we move workloads over. So, uh, but it's a good question. It's, it's a place that we're definitely going to have to address. Anybody? Anyone want to tell me about that cloud break thing? No? How am I doing on time? I think I'm pretty good, right? I got four minutes? Sweet. All right. OK. Well, uh, thanks for coming. I appreciate it. Uh, my email's on there. I, I gave the, the slide deck to the, uh, the folks running the conference, so feel free to grab it. And, and uh, uh, like I said, uh, uh, I answer my emails all the time. If you, you shoot me an email, I'd, I'd, I'd love to get some feedback, uh, uh, whether it's uh, uh, positive or negative. We, you know, in academia, that's uh, what we do, and that's what makes research so unique is that, you know, any type of feedback is, is good feedback to us. And, and uh, we're also looking for partners, and we're, we're looking for help. So, uh, you know, if you're in the, the kind of big data, data-intensive realm now, and you're a student or, or you're, uh, you know, uh, uh, somebody more senior like myself, uh, and you want to make a million dollars, you can go work for Yahoo or Hortonworks or whatever else. You want to change the world, you can come work for ASU, and uh, we'll, gladly, uh, we'll gladly take you on. So there you go. Thanks, guys.